ambition trumps talent every single time. So I have seen, there are people out there with so much more talent than I have, just so much more talent, but they do not produce work for whatever reason. And I think actually part of it is because they are so obsessed with creating something perfect uh, that they do not produce the work. Um, and I actually don't feel that I produce that much work compared to other, there are other people who are producing so much more work. And it is really that quantity. If you are just producing lots of stuff, people will see it. Um, and not all of it has to be perfect and not all of it has to be fantastic. Uh, but if you are if you are creating it consistently, mm -hmm. putting it out there, and letting people know through some sort of social media mechanism, this is here, um, you know, slowly and surely, I do think you start to build a platform. Geraldine, welcome to the show. Thank you much for being, thank you so much for being a guest today. Very excited to have you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for being here. I'm Thanks happy. for having me. I'm, I'm, we're, we're here together. We made it. We made it happen. Uh, I can't wait for today's uh, conversation. It's going to be wide ranging. And at the same time, if the people who are listening or watching, which we know they are, they identify as creator, as entrepreneurs, as people who want to do things in the world. Your story is a fascinating one on many different vectors. Uh, you do have a, a book that we're going to talk about today, but I think the story behind the book is also a fascinating one. So before we get into that, if you could, let's just go to like, what would that be? 30,000 feet in mm -hmm. our, our, we are not you flying in a Boeing 737. We are flying in a different airplane. And I would just, just orient us for people who might not be familiar with you or your work. Give us a little backstory. Like, um, what do you do? How do you describe yourself? And what is it that you're working on that, that makes you a guest on the show today? Um, yeah. So my name is Geraldine. Um, I am a James Beard award-winning writer. I am the voice behind the Everywhere blog, uh, which I don't know your audience may or may not be familiar with. Um, I've written a few viral blog posts that for some reason have just gone. Um, so one was about Mario Batali's cinnamon rolls. And that was the post that won me the James Beard Award. And that was shared by Martha Stewart, by um, Pete Wells of the New York Times. I think uh, Dan Savage was sharing it. Um, and then the second one was about an ill-fated Michelin starred restaurant. Um, <laughs> Which I love. That we ate way. at. Like, hilarious. Thank you. Ew. And that one ended up on the homepage of the New York Times. It was in the Washington Post. It was in uh, international headlines across Italy and also Stephen Colbert segment on it, of all things. <laughs> my first book came out in 2017 because my blog used to be more travel focused. So my first book is called All Over the Place and was a more travel centric book. Uh, and my second book um kind of in the wake of having these viral blog posts be very food focused. My second book uh, is a collection of food essays, and it is called If You Can't Take the Heat, Tales of Food, Feminism, and Fury. And that is out March 12th. And they will be, the 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 drop date for our show is timed with your podcast release. So I will say for you, it's available everywhere and it's amazing. I'm holding it up right now. Thank you for sending me an advanced copy. It's one of my favorite things about my job is I get to read all my friends and co-conspirators and inspirators. I get to read, read your stuff. Um, gosh, I feel like I always get it, get it early and it is such a treat. And I could say the same for this particular book. Amazing cover too, by the way. I, I'm, oh, thank I'm, you. I'm that working was, on the cover for my book right now. So I'm like inspiration whole, galore. Yeah. That's all. And that's a whole saga, isn't it? I'm really so, curious to hear how the cover. Yeah. I'm curious, oh. curious to hear that the cover uh, <laughs> conversation is going for you. It's uh, interesting. We'll leave it at that. Um, okay, my, so, so in battle, right? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm, I literally, I'm going to, I'm talking to my agent and publisher who I love, adore both of them deeply. Uh, but that, that is a conversation that I'm having today, a little bit later. So, yeah. um, but enough about me. Let's, so this, this book is to me 
a, a fascinating set of stories. Um, they all weave together in an interesting way. And a lot of this came about, if I'm not mistaken, from what I know, is you lost your job. And a lot of people that I know have either lost their job or we're on the, the backside of the pandemic here realizing that, man, you know, life is short. What are we going to do with our time? How do we want to spend our days? And it is a, a mission of the show to unpack people who have navigated that specifically because we should be doing the things that bring us joy in this world. So it, it would be an interesting thing to start with here on the show today. If you like walk us through the process, there was some changes in your life and you started making a go of something that was radically different than what you were doing before. Tell us about that. 2008. Uh, yep. I'm 27. I'm 43 now. So, uh, and I worked at a company called Cranium, which is the board game company. Um, so they were based here in Seattle. RIP Richard. Oh my gosh. Richard was our CEO. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Don't, uh, it's too early in the morning. Chase, do not. It's too, yeah, okay. It's too early in the Copy. morning. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. So Richard, Richard passed away. Oh shoot! What did you do? I'm sorry. <laughs> what did you do, I'm so sorry. I just love that man uh, so much, and you said his name. Yeah. No, you said his name. I just said. I'm so, I said his name. I can. I can't. Uh, not, I can't. I can't say cranium and not say his name because he was just an amazing friend. So. So. Yeah. So. You were there. Um, so Richard was was our CEO and unfortunately passed away. Uh, I believe. A year and a half ago now, yeah. um, due to complications from COVID, and he was very young, so that was quite shocking. That was yeah. jaw dropping, shocking. Um, so, in my early twenty or in my mid late twenties, at this point, worked there from kind of my mid twenties to my late twenties, um, and it was a unfortunately quite a shocking end to yeah. cranium. Like, not really great for a lot of us. Um, So I was on vacation in Italy uh, and I knew the end was coming and a friend of mine sent me a text and he was like, yeah, we've all been laid off. And I remember writing back, well, who's we? And he goes, you, me, and essentially everyone we work with. And I was like, oh, so it was, it was a pretty rough uh, acquisition and uh Hasbro took over the company and basically everyone got laid off. And so at this point, I'm I'm 27. I am engaged to who will, you know, my my now husband. Um, and I'm like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And he was like, well, you, you know what, you'll figure it out. And I had been blogging and writing. I was a copywriter at Cranium and I'd been blogging for them. And he's like, just, just write. He's like, just write. And you'll figure it out. So I did some freelance writing jobs and nothing was sticking. And at this, this point in time, my husband, who actually is a guest, was a guest on your show. So my husband's name is Rand Fishkin. Rand was traveling a ton. And I, he was like, well, why don't you, you know, you're doing this freelance work. Why don't you travel with me? And I said, all right, um, I'm going to do that for just a couple of weeks. So a couple of weeks turned into <laughs> a couple months. <laughs> and I was traveling with him and he's like, well, why don't you start, you know, I was sending these huge long emails about our travels to our friends and Rand said, well, why don't you start a blog? And I was like, well, I don't know. And so I start a blog and a couple, you know, a couple months turns into more months and suddenly I'm blogging more and more. And he's like, well, maybe this is what you do. And I'm like, no, this is not a thing. Like, this is not a thing people do. I am just getting up every day and writing a blog and traveling with you. This is not a thing. And every day, almost every day, I would wake up and I would say, what am I doing? And he would say, just keep writing. And I thought, this is this is the most directionless thing I have ever done. And I have to say, it was born of privilege. To be able to do something like this is completely born of privilege. And there, there in 2008, the blogging landscape, you have to understand, um, there was a lot of blogging going on. There was not a lot of other media creation. There was no TikTok. Yeah. People were not doing videos. YouTube was not what it was, if it even existed. I don't even remember. 
Um, it did, but barely. Barely, right? It was not the juggernaut it was. And so media creation was a lot smaller. People, And so people were reading blogs a lot. And amongst the travel blogs, I realized, you know, I wasn't the best photographer. I wasn't the, there was a lot of budget travelers and I wasn't really those. I wasn't a savvy traveler. I wasn't doing these massive backpacking around the world things that people were doing in 2008. Everyone was racing to be the next Bourdain and I couldn't do that. And the one thing I realized I had more than anyone else was time. I thought I could be more committed to this and more consistent than anyone else could. And I had a voice that was different. So I was like, all right, I'm going to blog every single day, Monday to Friday. And I am going to just have the most authentic voice. And that meant like I was going to be a hot mess. I was going to tell people when I messed up. I was going to tell people when I got lost. I was going to tell people when I got robbed or scammed. And it was just going to be kind of this humorous narrative blog. So two years in, and I remember the day before I was looking at job postings because I was like, what am I doing? Two years in, Time Magazine lists me as one of their top 25 blogs of the year out of nowhere. And my blog traffic uh, increases, I want to say, a hundredfold overnight. Oh, wow. And I'm like... Suddenly I'm like, what's going on? And Rand goes, I told you, I told you to just keep writing. So I keep doing that for a while longer. And the thing is that was a bump, but here's, here's, I don't know if you know, you probably know it goes like this, right? You're like, nothing, nothing, nothing. Something happened. And you're like, okay, I'm going to stay up here, but you don't, you drop, you don't drop back down to where you were, but you drop down a little bit and then nothing, nothing, nothing. And then something happens again. So I had the first drop down where nothing was happening again. And I was like, oh, am I, am I back down to where I was? Um, and I would write a bit and I would have a couple posts that went viral, a couple, but nothing really big. Um, and I wrote an article and an agent contacted me. And she said, Do you, are you interested in writing a book? And I'm like, yes, yes, absolutely. And I met with her and she did not want to represent me. And this happened like five more times. Wow. Yeah, it was devastating because all I wanted to do was write this book. And finally, I met my agent, Zoe, who represents me now. And we ended up selling my first book to auction. Um, and I was like, okay, this is it. This is it. And we didn't quite do what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> it did okay for it sold, you know, but like, what is it like 99% of books sell something like under 100 copies, you know, and I think I've sold, I think I've sold like 20,000 copies of my first book, which is respectable. Like, there's no, yeah, there's sure. no metric, there's no metric by which it's not respectable. Um, I've almost sold through my advance, which was like, I mean, we can talk about it too. I'm, I'm okay to talk about numbers. My first advance for my first book was $50,000, which is not bad for a first book. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm chugging along. Um, but now I'm like depressed. I'm like, my first book didn't do anything. And then I go into this state of kind of, uh, my father passes away. And that's kind of unrelated, but, and then Trump is elected, which for me was a blow. Maybe it's not for all of your listeners. Um, and then I had some other personal stuff that happened and I like just stopped doing anything. And I cannot write and I'm getting nothing done. And I'm like, well, I guess my career is over. Like I, I was done and I had this malaise. And so I was like down here, right? Like I was down in the bottom of, of the, of the career pit. And in 2017, end of 2017. So my book came out, 
When did my book come out? My first book, I want to say, came out early 2017. My father died 2016. So this was end of 2017. And I haven't written really. I haven't done anything for like a year and a half. Mario Batali sends out this cinnamon roll recipe in his apology letter for sexual harassment. And it's like his newsletter. And this is during kind of the apex of the Me Too movement. And it makes me so angry. And so I want to pitch it. I want to write a piece and I want to pitch it out to, like, I'm thinking I could send it to Bon Appetit. I'm thinking I could send it to all these places. And then I remember that none of these places ever buy my work. They never accept my pitches. And I'm at this point in my career where I know I can't take rejection. And I keep thinking about the thing that Rand always tells me, which is don't write for other people, write for your platform. So I decided to write the blog post on my platform instead. And the blog post, I write it in, and this is, I don't mean this as a flex, but I mean it as a where my brain was at the time. I wrote the Batali post in 45 minutes. Um, I sat down, spat it out, and it went viral in a way nothing I had written before had. My blog crashed. I think I got 5 million visitors to the blog in a week. Um, I, I was doing press for it. And then my Twitter account got hacked. I mean, it was bonkers. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not totally bad at this. Maybe there's something here. Um, but then I still don't, I still don't know what to do. And I'm vlogging a little bit, but nothing ever feels like that. Nothing ever felt like that post. So then COVID hits and I try and I'm trying to write and, you know, that's what we were all trying to do. We're like, okay, it's the, it's the worst time in our lives. Let's try and create the like big work of our lives. And I could talk about that, but that's a whole separate story. <laughs> and then I wrote when COVID ended. Or that's the wrong phrasing. When we were vaccinated, because it's still going on, when we were vaccinated, we took our, a trip to Italy. And uh, that's where my family's from. I did not think I would see a lot of people again. And we went to Italy and we had this disastrous meal. And I wrote a blog post about it. And that one went insanely viral again. And a friend of mine said, look, the two pieces that have been the biggest hits of your career have been food related. And she was like, I know you've been thinking a lot about your second book and it hasn't manifested. She goes, just write a book of food essays. She goes, you'll sell it in a minute. And that's what I thought. I thought, I'm just going to get, I'm just going to get the second book out there. I just need to get it done with because I don't know what's happening with my career. And that was the goal. Um, but after it started manifesting, I realized, oh, it's a, this is so natural feeling and this is so easy. So it went to auction. Uh, I wrote the pro, I wrote the, I wrote the um, proposal in like a few days and it went to auction and we wrote this book in less than a year. So it all manifested very, very quickly. Um, so that is where I am now. I'm like this accidental i call myself an accidental i was an accidental travel writer and now i think i'm an accidental food writer but there's and that was this, a very long story so but but that's but that's the goal with this format right and, and part of the reason that i think your that narrative arc is so fascinating is because it is filled with all of the same ingredients that every single one of us have experienced the the sort of pit of despair the doubt the wins along the way that are very difficult to you look in your in your back you, know, you look behind you in your rear mirror and you it's very difficult to see where they came from and then you have this or yeah you can't replicate like, them. I, right i have the paralysis like i want more of that juice that i just got but i don't know how i get it i i I, then you probably misascribe a bunch of things. Well, I did this and this, and I hopped on one foot and I ate pancakes on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. And you try and, you know, you try and recreate these things that you did. And what I love about your story is that at the core of it, 
it was something that Rand said to you early on, just keep writing. Yeah. And uh, so I'm wondering, I guess the question that is that precipitates from that is, do you feel like that actually was the cure for your you know, personal journey and ironically, your professional journey was just keep doing the thing. And because it didn't seem like you didn't tell stories about doing a lot of other stuff. you like, you hope to get an agent and you, you, you wrote, but it wasn't like you were doing everything possible in the world to make yourself a writer. You were doing the verb so you could become the noun. Again, we're talking about several years ago. So the the blogs had a different visibility. Twitter was Twitter was a, a different format of visibility. But I would say that, and I have said this often. Um, you know, first of all, you can't you can't be the thing you want to be without doing the thing, right? Like, right? You can you can wish all you want to be like an actor, but if you do not go on auditions, it's not going to happen. The other thing I would say, and I think this is something that actually my husband and I have discussed a lot of the time, is that ambition trumps talent every single time. So I have seen, there are people out there with so much more talent than I have, just so much more talent, but they do not produce work for whatever reason. And I think actually part of it is because they are so obsessed with creating something perfect uh, that they do not produce the work. Um, and I actually don't feel that I produce that much work compared to other, there are other people who are producing so much more work. And it is really that quantity. If you are just producing lots of stuff, people will see it. Um, and not all of it has to be perfect and not all of it has to be fantastic. Uh, but if you are if you are creating it consistently, and that's what I was doing for those first two years, especially, you know, creating it consistently, mm -hmm. putting it out there and letting people know through some sort of social media mechanism, this is here. Um, you know, slowly and surely, I do think you start to build a platform. It is not impossible. And so I think that and, I, I've seen people do it. I have. And just take, for example, the, the post, the Batali post, 45 minutes. Yeah. Right. This is an example of just producing and the muscle gets strengthened, mm -hmm. that creative muscle inside of you. The habit is there to put it out regardless of if it's an A or a C minus. Exactly. And yeah, and and to me, this is, you know, when I do did, you know, did the research in advance of our conversation today and I went back and I read a lot of these old posts. They're hilarious. They're brilliant. And there there's this urgency with them that you can tell. There's an authenticity. And I feel like in the same way that the message that you're sharing is like show up consistently, do work in order to be the verb or to be the noun, you have to do the verb. And the thing that actually cut through was the you part of the work. And I think so many creators, they're looking out there for the thing that they want to, you know, I need to be this or that. And that when you're like, what, how did these, this, freaking cinnamon roll recipe make me feel tick, 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 tick. you know it just then it just sort of falls out of you but it can't fall out of you if you haven't spent time doing that over and over and over so the question here is how important was the you part of your work relative to all the other um uh stuff that you you've articulated as valuable how much of it was the the you part it's my only differentiator. It's my only differentiator, right? Like I am not, I am not smarter. I am not more clever. Like I am not funnier. I am not like we can go through the list, right? <laughs> we can go through the list of things I'm not, I am not prettier. I am not more talented, like, but I am more me than anyone else out there. And I'm going to, Rand is, I can hear my husband rolling his eyes from 
three floors <laughs> down because I'm going to quote Springsteen right now. But so have you read Springsteen, or listened to Springsteen's memoir? So uh -uh. there is a part. Oh, my God. It's OK. So there is a part in his memoir where he realizes he's like, I wasn't the best songwriter. Right. And I didn't have the best voice. And he goes, I realized that. But what I realized is that I could sing my songs with a sort of authenticity and uniqueness that no one else could. And, and so ultimately what he realized is I could be more Bruce Springsteen than anyone could be. And so I needed to make them want Bruce Springsteen. And that's fundamentally true. And so what, what I think people need to realize is you need to make people want you. And so you need to be authentically you. I want to interject something here, a yeah. question, because there are people who I think are so judgmental of themselves, and we all are at different mm -hmm. times in our life, but how, when you might be insecure, you're like, I don't have anything to say. My life isn't special. I'm not special, or I don't feel like showing up. You know, it's hard to stand out and fit in at the same time. Like, what would you say to someone who has a lot of those insecurities. Did you ever have those insecurities? And is that a piece of this <laughs> this puzzle? <laughs> oh, sorry. Did I ever have those insecurities? Sorry. Sorry. I love it. But that's what but but right now that's keeping someone from doing the thing you're asking them to do. Right. But like I think also I think also well I think that's twofold. I think one is like acknowledging that everyone feels that way, right? Like everyone fundamentally feels that way. We all have imposter syndrome. I have talked to New York Times bestselling authors who are like, how did I get here? You know, I talked to a woman who yesterday had two James Beard awards. Um, and she was like, I, I don't know. I don't, I still have imposter syndrome. And I was like, yep, Katie, they keep giving you these awards because they feel bad for you. That's what happened. <laughs> That's what's going on. So I, I would say one thing fundamentally is to realize that everyone feels that way. And I also think, I, I guess it depends on what story you want to tell, you know? And if you are comfortable telling it, revealing that. And I think that there is something deeply relatable in that. Um, mm. You know, I can't, I don't know how to make people believe in themselves. I don't, but I can't, like, that's a hard thing to overcome because I fundamentally, there are days when I wake up and I'm like, I'm not good enough and I haven't succeeded and I haven't achieved what I wanted to. Um, but I will say that, you know, I think along with that, there is, like you have to figure out what do you want more? Do you want to feel self-conscious more? Do you want to feel your insecurity more? Or do you want your goal more? Like, which do you want more? And if you want to achieve your goal more, then you just have to fight through this and be like, all right, I don't think anybody wants to hear what I say, but you just got to say it anyway. You just got to fake it. That's what I did for years. I pretended I had an audience when I didn't have one. I pretended I knew what I was doing when I didn't. And then I straight up said I didn't know what I was doing when I didn't. And that got me an audience. So. And yeah. then 5 million people show up on your doorstep. <laughs> um, Who saw that? I didn't thank you for see that one coming. <laughs> <laughs> but no one does, right? That's the thing is, yeah. I mean, Lady, Lady Gaga was toiling in, you know, smoky bars in the Lower East Side until she wasn't. Right. right. All, like this is the story over and over and over again. And part of what I'm fascinated yeah. about what I why I wanted to dig into your story is because it Yeah. It's it is just another beautiful manifestation. And to go from, you know, your friends reading your blog to five million people and being one of the top in you know, Time magazine's top blogs. And yet you parlayed that into, you know, your first book, which you were very candid about, and this latest book, which is, I mean, I also want to be clear. I am a food aficionado. I have many friends who are like you, James Beard Award winners, 
whether they're chefs or writers, and I like food. And still, this book captured my heart and spirit. Oh, thank you. Regardless of the, uh, regardless of you know that food is actually a subtext, right? Food is a. These are these are journeys for you personally. Talking about the nostalgia I had talking when you were talking about Cheez Its and you know all of the things that that. And you're you were you were a cat as a kid running around the house and they couldn't let you out because you were feral. you know you were wild. Yeah. To me, those yeah, feral, feral children. Um, is that that same part of you that is just playing the the part of you that is able to write all those things that you would not expect from a a food writer? Uh, is your ability to write about that and to write about your own experiences? Do you do that? because you know that it works or almost sort of in in spite of it like this is it's the only way you can be is that that same paradigm that you were talking about earlier you just go to what you know and you find all the little beautiful details in there because i'm I, you know i felt like i was along for the ride of your life as you're writing about these food stories and it's about food but it's not oh well first of all thank Thank you. Like that's a kind of a, a beautiful endorsement of of the book. So I'm I'm really touched by that. Um, I would have to say, you know, one thing is whatever you do ends up being like flexing a muscle. You know, um, and this kind of goes back to what I said earlier, where I think ambition and and the people who do it more trump the talent. So I think if you continue to practice your craft, you become better at it to the point that maybe would would exceed someone who comes with natural talent. Now, I'm not saying that I'm coming to the to the playing field with this, you know, wealth of skill now, but I'd say wherever it is, whatever I'm able to produce now, it's because I've been consistently trying to create for all of these years for good and for bad um and putting so much out there that maybe didn't work and i think that because i had this you know this ability to kind of practice on the blog for so many years mm -hmm. to see what did work and what didn't uh that really enabled me to to embark on this in a way that wasn't completely blindfolded um i would say that i realized oh all those years of just keep writing when it came to sitting down to a book it wasn't as difficult as i thought it was going to be in terms of the stories that emerged you know, a friend of mine said something which is she said food writing is never about food and that hit me. And whenever I had trouble writing this, I was like, I don't, you know, and I had trouble going in. I was like, I don't know if I can write an entire book about food. And then I realized, oh, I'm not really writing an entire book about food. I'm writing an entire book about my relationship with food. And that made it a lot easier. So that, that, that again, that, that, yeah, to me, that's it changed like the my texture. You could say that about anything. And, and we lose Absolutely. that perspective as soon as we start you know, and this is the the creative conundrum, right? It's just when you're reading everybody else's stuff, it feels so natural. But when you then you like, we're having this conversation right now, and it was at the end of the day, it it is the individuality that we are all attracted to in others' arts of work. It's sort of like what's the phrase? In the particular mm -hmm. lies the universal, so right? true. and we keep forgetting it's that. So true. And you you've just done a masterful job of it to realize that it's not about again i i i like food i have eaten a lot of you know amazing restaurants the story of your i i've had similar meals i will not say not in europe i mean in europe as well like jean georges jean georges in in paris a 26 course meal where they bring you foamed uh cantaloupe <laughs> juice and it's supposed to be a meal. Like, I mean, it, it was a very, very, very funny uh, article that you wrote. But that's, you know, that you're writing about, that you're actually writing about life and that and, and your experience specifically, which is something that uh, I think we all could use a reminder. 
I want to just give a shout out again to the title. If you can't take the heat, Tales of Food, Feminism, and Fury. Amazing, Thank amazing you. book. And help me understand, I guess, before I, I let you go, help me understand what did you do well in this book and what would you do differently? Oh, goodness. That is a question. Um, and this- I'm a professional, so- Geraldine. Yes. This is my job. Yes. <laughs> Oh, it's so funny too, because I'm sitting here telling people that you need to believe in yourself and who you are has value, right? Who you inherently are has value. And even if you think you don't have value, you do. People want to hear directly from you. They want your work. They want your uniqueness. Like that is important. That is what you bring to the world. Even as I'm saying that, when you're like, Geraldine, what did you do properly? I'm like, I don't know. Anybody could have done that. I don't know if I, so like what, (laughs) this is the eternal, this is the eternal struggle of any creator. But I would say is in terms of what I did well is I think I authentically brought myself to this book, right? Mm -hmm. Like a friend of mine read it and she said, I could hear your voice in these pages. And I'm, I would say I'm very proud of that. Um, And in addition to that, you know, to your point, because I authentically brought myself to these pages and because those experiences were so true to me, they, there is something universal about them. So the number of people I've had who have said, God, this chapter hit me so hard. I related so much to this. And what's been amazing to me is that no one has said the same chapter. Like no one has. They pulled out chapters and I was like, that was the one? That's the one that resonated with you? So that's been overwhelming to me. That's been phenomenal. So I think I did, I think bringing myself and kind of the universality of those experiences, I think I did that well. In terms of what I did not do well, I mean, God, I, there's so much, right? Like, obviously, the job of any creative is to second guess themselves um, and then third guess themselves and then, you know, do that ad nauseum. So, so are there things I would have changed? Maybe. Are is there places where I would have held back? Maybe. Um, I would say that one thing that I've noticed, and this is a broader issue for me, is that I am able to, I I am now at the point where first it was that I couldn't bring, you know, it was the struggle to bring myself authentically to my work. And now it is that I am more comfortable writing my feelings than I am telling people to their faces. Mm -hmm. So that is a struggle. That is a more philosophical struggle and less about the work. So if you want to tell me, uh, if I w- if I were to tell you truly about the work, what I would have changed, I would have not done as much alliteration because when you have to record your audio book, <laughs> alliteration is an absolute pain in the ass. Oh, I did you're my own stunts there, too. Like, I know how hard that is. Oh my God. <laughs> you're like, why did I write that sentence? You're like, Who wrote it this? looks so good. It looks so good typed out. And then you start to say it after you've been recording for five hours. Again, the title for those of you out there, if you can't take the heat, tells of food, feminism and fury. I was, uh, it's a page turner. I I found myself going back to the first recipe that I ever personally came up with was was. was a a fascinating uh, mixture of sliced cheese. Mm -hmm. What kind of cheese? the shittiest orange <laughs> Safeway cheese that was in my refrigerator from my mom. I'd slice okay. that up. I put it on bread and I'd put it in the <laughs> microwave and I'd microwave it for 45 seconds. And what came out was this soggy, nasty ass, beautiful thing to me. That was my first recipe. And I was proud AF of that. I mean, it was like, course and i would not touch this i mean the the bread was so soggy that you couldn't actually hold it i mean it had no you know had no no stability like a spoon yeah i want to say thank you so much for bringing me back to that time and and helping me cover so much other ground and it's been a treat to hear about your story thank you for being so transparent 
and I'm a fan. You're always welcome on the show. I hope the book does oh, super you. well. It, it would not surprise me one bit when uh, it does well when it comes out. And thanks so much for being a guest in the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I hope you make that recipe again. <laughs> we do. It would just be, I would have to make a special store or a special trip to a terrible store to buy terrible ingredients to make something that was terrible, but it might just be worth it. Yeah, I believe in you. <laughs> Signing off for myself and Geraldine. Uh, until next time, thanks for tuning in. 